Welcome back to the Locked On Diebacks podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. And if you're here to discuss D backs versus Mets, well, we got Ryan Finkelstein of Locked On Mets joining the show to break it all down for you next. That is not the intro. You are Locked On Diamondbacks, your daily Arizona Diamondbacks podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Miller Thomas of Locked On Dieback still here. I'm a multimedia journalist and I'm a graphic designer. So please go check out my website, MillerThomas24.myportfolio.com. On there, you can see all my latest work from my packages to my articles to my photos and my graphic design. Of course, thank you for making Locked On Dimebacks your first listen every day. I would not be able to do this podcast without you, my loyal listeners, sharing, subscribing, and viewing, doing all that so I could do this podcast for you. Thank you. It's free and available on all platforms so please continue to tell your friends but without further ado let's bring on ryan finkelstein of locked on mets to discuss the little series because heading into sunday the d-backs just needed to win sunday's matchup to get their first series win of the year unfortunately they were not able to get it done against the new york mets but overall i want to hit on some bigger points of this series because i think the story of this series was the pitching and that Mets pitching staff, even down to Grom, is still pretty nasty. I mean, we saw newly acquired Chris Bassett in that first game. Uh, David Peterson, I mean, I'm not too big on him. He started yesterday. But uh, on Saturday, we saw Carlos Carrasco, who was basically out the entire season last year. So I want to first start with the pitching, Ryan, just kind of ask you, how do you like this Mets rotation, specifically Chris Bassett, the newly acquired guy? How do you think he fits into this rotation? And what have you seen so far from, from the dude? Well, I think the two guys you mentioned there, it's interesting because Carlos Carrasco was supposed to be the Chris Bassett edition last year, and it just didn't happen. And then he ends up blowing on a hamstring in spring training, not around until August, gets rushed back. He was rehabbing at the big league level, and that just did not work for the Mets last season. So I think you went into this season and everyone's expectations were really low for Carlos Carrasco. But personally, I looked at the larger sample of his career and I thought, you know, Carlos Carrasco is still a veteran pitcher that can mix his pitches. And if he's healthy and he got surgery to clean up his elbow and he's in really good shape, he could be a number three for this Mets team. Then they go out and get Chris Bassett, who also could be a really great number three, honestly, was the ace of the athletics. So these two guys have been frontline starters before. You add them in as these quality veterans that you're pairing with, hopefully, Jacob DeGrom and Max Scherzer. And even without DeGrom right now, that one, two, three of Scherzer, Bassett, and Carrasco, it's as good as any in baseball because these are three veterans that have seen it all, done it all, and early in this season are all pitching very well. Yeah, I admittedly haven't watched a ton of Bassett covering the D-back. He was in Me the neither. American League. So I haven't, yeah, I haven't seen a ton of him, and I always thought, just looking at the stats, I was like, yeah, he's pretty good. Like you said, maybe a number three. But so far with the Mets, I'm like, dang, this dude looks like a number yeah. one. He looks like a frontline starter, at least at the very least, a number two. And I hit my uh, pod pretty hard whenever I've talked about the Mets and Carlos Carrasco. Like last year when that deal happened, I was like that the most underrated part of that Lindor trade was getting Carrasco back in that deal. Because if you looked at his numbers with the Guardians, like the dude was like a 3-2, 3-3 ERA for like seven straight seasons. I think he was kind of overlooked in Major League Baseball. So I thought the, I thought getting Chris Bassett and then the return of Carlos Carrasco was going to be a huge boost to that Mets rotation. But now you got this newcomer who I have no idea who he is, Tyler McGill. He's all of a sudden pitching like the best pitcher in baseball. I think he's starting today for the New York Mets. We're recording this on Monday, so I think he's going today. Ryan, yep. I need you to tell me, because in my fantasy baseball league this morning, I traded Tyler McGill and Justin Turner for Manny Machado. Am I going to, you know, in six months, feel like a fool for trading McGill? Um. You know, that's honestly a pretty good trade, I think, because you okay, know, and yeah. I'm not even the biggest fantasy guy, but... You know, Machado, you're getting one of the best players in baseball. And Miguel, there is a a real chance he'll be out of the rotation at some point. So you could uh, end up with a good trade there. Miguel is this guy that uh, burst onto the scene last year. And what people don't understand about Tyler Miguel is this is a guy who, in double A, was basically just throwing fastballs. He he still didn't have a slider, didn't have a changeup. He really did refine those pitches at the big league level last year. And last year... He started off really high. I think he had a 2.06 ERA through his first seven starts. Had like a 1.05 ERA in July last year. 
then was was pretty bad for the rest of the season. I think his ERA might have been over seven in his final 13 some odd starts. So he really struggled. But before last season, the most innings he had thrown in a year in any of his professional seasons was 35. He jumped up to 130 last year. So I think the arm got tired, but it was a great experience for him to get all those innings under his belt. And now he's come back after a healthy off season and he's throwing even harder than ever before. He's six foot seven. He can touch the upper nineties. He lives at 97. The slider looks better. The changeup looks really good. So he has a weapon for left-handed and right-handed batters. He's really an X factor for this Mets rotation because uh, they didn't even expect for him to be in the starting group. And now I look at him and I almost think he might be ahead of the depth chart of a guy that you're familiar with in Taiwan Walker. Yeah, I'm a little familiar with Taiwan Walker. I wish he was still on the D-backs. I mean, as soon as the D-backs let him go and non-tendered him, the dude went on to, you know, have an all-star season with you guys. I think he had a pretty good run with the Mariners, too. So I was pretty disappointed to see Taiwan Walker. Now he's like, what, your sixth starter? If DeGrom's healthy, Scherzer, Bassett, uh, Carlos Carrasco. Like, it's an embarrassment of riches that the Mets have. And I thought the D-back starters did a good job matching up with them. Of they course, did. Zach Davies and game Friday against Bassett. We got destroyed. I think that was like a 10-3 ball game. We got destroyed in that one, okay? But Saturday, the D-backs had a good performance. Zach Allen, first start of the season. He looked pretty solid in his four innings. Yesterday, Humberto Castellanos went. He pitched well. I mean, I don't trust him as a long-term guy. He's a guy who's like 24 years old and his fastball's already below 90 miles per hour. I don't <laughs> think that's going to survive long-term, so we'll see how it goes with that. But... Once we got out of the starters, the D-backs bullpen was not exactly able to hold it up. I mean, you saw Caleb Smith come in Friday. He got lit up. The D-backs sent him right down to the minor leagues as soon as that game ended. <laughs> Yesterday, one, we brought in Oliver Perez, who's 40 years old. He got hit around a little bit. Noah Ramirez gave up a couple of runs. But from the Mets side, they completely shut down the D-backs basically the last couple of games. Even the first game, like the D-backs really weren't able to do anything with that Mets bullpen. So do you see that bullpen as an area of strength for the Mets this season? Because I feel like in the years past, the Mets bullpen usually was maybe more of a point of contention like the Yuri's film, uh, Familias and some guys who you're like, yeah, they're good, but I don't know if I could trust them in a high leverage moment to get the job done. Well, so it's interesting because I actually think at some point this year we might be talking Mark Belance into the Mets trades. That might be a oh. future crossover. So just just to get your your, your okay. uh, listeners ready for that. Uh, look, right now the bullpen has been the number one concern, but it's it, it's only the concern because the lineup has looked great and the rotations look great. So you have to nitpick something. And you know th the Mets have been in position to basically win every single game, other than that game the Diamondbacks won where they got the lead first. The Mets have basically had leads in all the games, even the ones that they've lost, and the bullpen has blown it. But your bullpen is never going to be perfect. I, I think they have enough pieces there. They're going to add to that bullpen at some point. But Edwin Diaz uh, is one of the best closers in baseball when he's right. They have some guys like Drew Smith and Trevor May who have looked good uh, early in the season. Seth Lugo hasn't looked great. Uh, Joely Rodriguez, a trade they made giving him Miguel Castro, has not panned out up to this point. But I, I think they have enough arms. And I also think that the, the real strength of this team is that starting pitching we're mentioning. And I just envision when this team gets to the playoffs, you're going to be able to throw a, a McGill and a Walker probably out of the bullpen as well. So that'll really help um, when you get to that point. Because if the Mets are healthy, their playoff rotation – uh, which I think is the biggest strength of this team, could be Jacob deGrom, Max Scherzer, Chris Bassett, Carlos Carrasco. Man, and then McGill just coming up the bullpen would just be absolutely insane exactly. once he got to the playoffs. I mean, Lanson, he he could be on the trading block once we get to the deadline, the way this D-back season is already going because people talked about that in the offseason. It's like, why are the D-backs signing an all-star closer? I mean, I thought we needed him. The D-backs had the worst yeah. bullpen in baseball last season. So I was like, finally, we're getting Mark the Shark. We're getting Ian Kennedy. But the way this season's going, we might have to trade Mark Lanson at the deadline. But if you believe the D-backs are going to trade on uh, if you do believe the D-backs are going to trademark Melanson at the deadline. Maybe you should bet on it, Ryan. And the best place to place your betting wagers is betonline.net because it's your number one source for all your betting stats and sports info. Find all the latest sports developments, league reviews, and news, including this year's basketball playoffs and the start of the Major League Baseball season. BetOnline is your continued source for all your sports wagering information from live betting to playoffs, esports, and more. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends and actions. Bet online where the game starts. 
All right, here, crossover with Locked On Mets host Ryan Finkelstein. And now I want to talk a little bit about the offense because from the D-backs perspective, I mean, there wasn't a lot going on. I feel like they did a pretty good job throughout the series getting dudes on the bases, which they've been able to do the last couple of series. They, it felt like a lot of these innings, it was like one or two men on, but consistently the D-backs are not able to come through with runners in scoring position. They leave a ton of dudes on the bases. I think if I check the numbers, the D-backs are by far the worst team in baseball with runners in scoring position. They're probably the, the worst scoring team in baseball. I think the only dude on their team with over like a 175 average is Seth Beer, who's only allowed to play against right-handed pitching for some reason. Like, I don't understand why we do these splits. Like, every D-backs hitter has two hits or less, but yet our best player, he has to sit every day because of some dude on the mound the lefty and lefty matchup don't even get me started on that but from the Mets perspective I mean you guys got a couple uh you guys got a whole bunch of newbies uh, a couple former D-backs how are you liking this new Mets offense how do you like the newbies and how do you think the newbies fit into this team as opposed to years past like what makes or how is this Mets offense different than what we've seen the past few years basically as well like for the Diamondbacks listeners I'll start with uh your old friend Eduardo Escobar I, mm-hmm. I love watching him uh, just gives good at bats. You can tell the pops there. Um, even even at third base, has been better than I even expected. So Eduardo Escobar has been a really nice addition. Starling Marte is a player that you just you can't take your eyes off of. I mean, he is such a special athlete. Uh, you know, I went into the year and I said Pete Alonso is going to lead the league in RBIs, and it was in large part because they got Starling Marte because I think he adds ten to fifteen RBIs to to Alonso's total just with that speed. You know, he's able to get himself in scoring position just by stealing those bases. So those guys have been great. Mark Canna came in and had a really good start to the year. The other free agent signed that they made all three of those guys in one day. They get three veterans who are 32 years old that have seen it all that come in and really give this lineup that that veteran experience they needed last year. uh, You know what you were just talking about the Diamondbacks. That was the story for the Mets last year. They could not hit with runners in scoring position. And so far this year they have. Um, Jeff McNeil has, has been great. I, I, another guy that I was r- really high on that a lot of people have given up on. And I said, I, I thought he was going <laughs> to have a huge bounce back season and he's been Jeff McNeil again. So that's been good to see. So you're, you're seeing a lot of these guys um, factor into to the equation for this Mets team. And uh, when you have Lindor and Alonzo going with all these other pieces around them, it, it's a really dangerous lineup. Yeah, and do you know like the philosophy the Mets front office had in targeting these players? Because to go out there and get quality at bats without like breaking the bank on the Corey Seegers or the Marcus Simeons, which your owner might not be afraid to do now that you got the billionaire owner no longer in the Ponzi scheme, you know, debts. Now yeah. that you got real money coming in, like I don't think that owner is afraid to spend money. We've seen it multiple times, but to go out there and get these really high quality players, but on you know, not crazy contracts like Starring Marte, it's like four years, 76 million. Starring Marte is one of the most underrated players in baseball. You have already said it with his speed like the dude like was top three in both the leagues last year in stolen bases like his speed is insane yeah. he can hit for average during the 2020 short season i truly believe he was the d-backs best player and who did the d-backs get back in return when they traded starring Marte? they got back caleb smith who, and i think they got back uh they might have got back Castellanos in that deal too i don't think so i'd have to double check but they got back caleb smith as the headliner who you saw friday get absolutely schlacked by the mets and then they sent him back to the minor leagues after that but when the Marlins traded starting Marte, they got back Jesus Lazardo from the Oakland A's. So don't even get me started about the value that the D-backs did back for starting Marte as opposed to other teams. So I'm still really upset that we have to break up the Marte Parte. Eduardo Escobar, we traded him last year at the deadline, got back Cooper Hummel. I don't know how that deal's working out so far. I think I'd rather have Fogo power on my sideline. So again, I guess, I guess I'm going on a little bit of a tangent here, but what is the Mets philosophy for targeting these players? Because they were able to get a lot of good quality players without breaking the bank, which we know they're not afraid to do. I think there's a couple things. For one, I think the Mets really valued the character of the guys that they were signing. I actually think that was something that was key. I don't know if they're completely blaming uh, last season on some of the guys that have departed, and we don't need to mention who they are, but <laughs> I do think that that was important. And like Eduardo Escobar is widely regarded as one of the greatest teammates in baseball. Uh, you know, that that's, that's no doubt about it. You know, Mark Hanna, I think has a pretty good reputation as well. They really went out of their way to meet Mark Hanna in the free agent process. They flew out to Mark Hanna's home and, and try to get a sense of who he was. And then Starling Marte, I, I said going into the offseason, he was the number one target the Mets should go after. And I really believe that when it comes to free agents, 
he's in that class of, of one of the best players that changed teams. Marcus Simeon maybe had the best stats, but if you look at what Marte did in his 120 some odd games last year, when it comes to F war, uh, he was right there with Simeon as like the most valuable free agent that could change teams. And, and I think what they really wanted is guys that give you good at bats that get on base and also that aren't going to hurt you defensively. So that's why I don't think that they really wanted to target some of the guys that Philly signed and Castellanos and Schwarber. It was more about getting guys that could feel their position and be good veteran leaders that could also give you great at bats whenever they came up. Yeah, and you've already seen it with Marte. Like, he just affects so many different areas of the game when he gets on the base pass, what he can do at the plate. Like, Marte is a really special player. And I think the character thing that you bring up is really important because Eduardo Escobar was like a huge fan favorite for the D backs. You know, in the early part of the season last year when the D backs were winning some games, him and David Peralta would be playing the Hispanic music in the locker room post game. They'd be doing the dancing celebrations. Like, that was all the D backs had to look forward to. Let's win so we could watch these post game celebrations with all the dudes in the locker room. And, and uh, Eduardo Escobar was usually the one leading it. But we're here talking about the Mets offense. And we even, we haven't even talked about like Francisco Lindor really, who. We know struggled last season, but you wouldn't know watching this D-back series because what was it Friday night? He smashed two home runs against the D-back. So do you believe in the Francisco Lindor bounce back? Because to start the year, I think it's uh, crystallizing itself for anyone who made those predictions. Yeah, I was I was one of those. Uh, you know, I've never jumped off the, the Lindor bandwagon. Uh, last year, it, it was one of the seasons I tried to always provide context for people because it was a terrible start. Don't get me wrong. His first two months were awful. He was hitting below the Mendoza line for most of that stretch. But you look at his numbers from June 1st on, it was a 124 WRC plus, which was online for what he's done in his career. So I saw his stats last season from June on, and I said, this was the same guy. He's never been the guy that has been the best offensive shortstop in baseball. He brings his value from his glove, but he also is a shortstop that can hit you 30 home runs. And since June 1st last year, he is behind only um, Fernando Tatis Jr. when it comes to home runs hit by shortstop. He's tied with, or at least I don't know who else might have homered on, on Saturday and Sunday, but when I checked the stats on after the two home run game on Friday against the D-backs, he was second with 19 home runs tied with guys like Bo Bichette, uh, Dansby Swanson, uh, and others, and Correa as well. So, if he's right, which is where he's at right now, and he could be a 30 home run shortstop while giving you gold glove defense, who cares about the contract? He's going to be helping you win a lot of games. And so far this season, we're seeing that. I'm pretty sure he's reached base safely in every game so far. He looks a lot more comfortable. And the other comparison I want to bring real quick is, uh, you know, as a longtime Mets fan, I remember Carlos Beltran and, and his first two years with the Mets. Very similar players, both Puerto Rican descent. Both switch hitters, both starting in small markets in the AL Central. Beltran's first year with the Mets, not good. He was an all-star, but that was just based on name recognition. Did not play like an all-star. Year two, he was a top five MVP finisher. I think we're going to see something similar from Lindor this year. Yeah, I hope so, because Lindor, I thought, was a pretty good player, I think, of course, with the Guardians. And the contract, we'll see how it plays out. I don't think you'll worry about too much on the front half. That I think the back half is where you'll probably start yeah. to worry. But that's with all the these big contracts that are like eight years plus. Like all these players, you're going to have to worry once we start getting to the second half of the season. But it looks like he's fixed some of his flaws from last year with the New York Mets. And if you want to fix your car, just go to rockauto.com because... With the ever-increasing number of makes and models, it's now impossible for your local chain auto parts store to stock all the parts your car will need. Why endure often pointless or seemingly intimidating questioning and wait while the person behind the counter orders the parts on their computer, choosing the only brand their warehouse happens to carry? Save time and money when using Rock Auto. Why choose to spend 30%, 50%, even 100% more for the same parts from a chain store or car dealership? Rock Auto is a family business serving do yourselfers for over 20 years. Go to rockauto.com right now. See all the parts available for your car or truck right locked on in there. How did you hear about us, Box? So they know we sent you. Amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the parts your car will ever need. Visit rockauto.com. All right, all right, all right. Ryan Finkelstein of Lockdown Mets joining here today for a little crossover action. And Ryan, I don't know what I want to start with first in segment number three, but I think I'll probably start here. We did see a rumor floating around in the offseason that maybe the New York Mets could be interested in a Luke Weaver. Now, 
after seeing this Mets rotation, after seeing Bassett and Carrasco and McGill, I mean, Taiwan Walker's on the injured list. He's your sixth starter. I think he's firmly better than Luke Weaver. So at this point of the year, like, um, do you, do you even think that's even a possibility? Do you think the Mets still want a Luke Weaver? I mean, what's going on with the, because I think if the D-backs were to train, Luke Weaver, they would probably want back a Dominic Smith, one of those other outfielders you have. I can't think of the other guy's name right now. I'm going to have to pull a baseball reference. But what do you think about the idea of the Mets getting Luke Weaver? Do you even think that's still a possibility for this team? I think it would, it would be a couple injuries that have to take place. Uh, going into the year, uh, the Mets had Tyler McGill and David Peterson as their six and seven. And I felt like that was um, exactly where they should have been throughout the offseason. So by adding Bassett and Scherzer, they are able to put those guys as the depth starters, and I think that depth um, is fine for the Mets right now. And like I said before, McGill has sort of even supplanted uh, Taiwan Walker in the rotation, I think, once they do get the ground back. So it, it, I think they're fine when it comes to starter depth, but you never know as the season progresses. Um, and again, I will mention that the Melanson thing is one that I would really keep your eyes on. I, I remember our, our old friend Arm Layton, as soon as the Diamondbacks made that signing, he, he, he tweeted out that this is basically like an agreement between player and team that we're going to give you the two-year contract and then we're going to get something for you at the deadline. Um, I imagine that could be the case. And I think you could see in that scenario, depending on how the Mets season goes, a player like Dominic Smith or J.D. Davis going back to the Diamondbacks with the prospect to get him a Lanson. And I think that those are two guys who would immediately help the Diamondbacks line up um, who are still under control for two more years after this season. So they would have some time with them to either extend them or just maybe trade them in the future themselves. And they would probably get some type of a prospect in that type of a trade as well. So th that would be the trade that I would really look out for, because I do think this is a Mets team that will be looking to add uh, a closer type at, at the deadline. Yeah, I would be interested in a J.D. Davis just because because he's a right-handed uh, right batter, and the D-backs need more right-handed batters in their lineup. Dominic Smith would probably just be too redundant, and I probably don't want both of them just because the D-backs have um, their top prospects or outfielders, and they're pretty much going to be coming up in the next couple seasons, like we'll probably see Alec Thomas this year, maybe Corbin Carroll next season. But Luke Weaver, he's actually now out of the bullpen. He's no longer a rotation starter. The D-backs started the year with him in the bullpen because he's been that disappointing, and his velo has been that much of a concern. Like, I don't even think the Mets want to go near him anymore. There's so many question marks and red flags surrounding Luke Weaver. It's really disappointing to see, considering he was maybe the headliner in that Paul Goldschmidt deal. So to see that he was a part <laughs> to be a frontline starter, he looked like that dude in 2019. And then every season since, he's just kind of been going downhill. It's not a fun time to be a D-backs fan. But like I said, I would be interested in jd davis and if we got a prospect back from mark melanson that would be fantastic i would probably disagree or push back a little bit with arm lane said i don't think it was just a straight up agreement the d-backs in front of office were like yeah we're gonna <laughs> sign mark melanson to sign him because i think the d-backs are i don't That's know true. if they're delusional but they kind of believe like they wanted to compete this year and our biggest weakness was the bullpen they kind of just keep thinking if they keep running it back with the team they have maybe work around the edges that they could maybe make a run at one of the wild card spots. And it just never seems to work out because they don't have enough talent on their team. So they probably will trade Mark Melanson with the way this season's going, but what, what what's happened basically with the careers of JD Davis and Dominic Smith, because these look like two up and coming players for the Mets. They've had flashes at the plate. They both got some different skill sets, but both of them I think have shown that they could be pretty good everyday major leaguers in the right scenario but the Mets went out there and they signed the Mark Hanna's and the starring Martes and said hey we're just gonna we're just gonna push you guys to the bench and start these guys over you because they're better and we don't necessarily believe in you that much so what's kind of happened with Dominic Smith and JD Davis and why should the D-backs want to take them back I, I think that the Mets are trying to remove as many question marks as possible and those guys just haven't established themselves um you know Dominic Smith I think will be a really good first baseman in this league at some point when he gets an opportunity. Um, defensively, I think he always has looked pretty good. And I, I think when he gets the at-bats, uh, he'll he'll come around. J.D. Davis is a player that just doesn't have a position defensively. Um, mm -hmm. The DH does open that up for him, and I think um, on another team he could really thrive. But the one problem for the Mets is uh, they just have other guys that they would rather get those at-bats to. In the early season, it's been Robinson Cano. Uh, but they also have these prospects in Mark Vientos and AAA. They have their catching prospect, Francisco Alvarez, who – is the youngest player in his league in double a and he's slugging over a thousand. He's just on an absolute tear. So I think there's guys that are waiting in the wings that the Mets would rather give those DH at bats too. And it just makes these guys 
um, a little bit of, of an extra luxury for now, but I think that they are um, held back by being with the Mets because they're not getting the opportunities that they could in other places where for their careers, they really could thrive. So the D-backs are a team that I think could take one of these guys, give them you know the 600 plate appearances over a full season. And I think both of these guys are capable to be 30 home run guys that could really help a team. It's just with the Mets, they did not uh, you know, stay consistent in their early careers when they did get their opportunities. And so the Mets, as a team that's going for it all, decided, yeah, instead of, instead of um, you know, J.D. Davis at third base, let's get Eduardo Escobar, who we know we can count on. Instead of having Dominic Smith in left field, let's sign a Mark Canna. Um, and, and I think that those have already been, you know, really good decisions for this Mets team. Yeah, and Escobar, he could play all over the diamond. I think he's best yeah. at third base, but you'll probably see him at second base, some first base. Like his position eligibility on fantasy is crazy. So I love Escobar for those yeah. reasons. JD Davis, I mean, that the defensive liability questions uh concern me a little bit because I mentioned earlier Seth Beer, who's our best offensive player, who's only allowed to play against right uh, right handed batters. The also the other problem with Seth Beer, he's only allowed to DH. He's not allowed to play first yeah. base or do anything defensively because he's not good at it. So maybe if the D backs are already sitting Seth Beer for lefties, then you can have JD Davis there in the DH spot, and then you could just have the best platoon DH uh in, in Major League Baseball. And I guess you could just own the DH because uh I guess you're the D backs and no one else is going to own the DH. So the D backs could own the DH. Why not? Um, but one other Mets guy that's still out there on the free agent market is Michael Conforto. The D-backs have been linked to him this offseason. It was mostly pre-lockout. And I haven't really seen anything too much on Conforto, like rumors or any teams he's linked to. Like, what's going on with Conforto? I did see that one story where it was like, maybe he wasn't healthy in the offseason. He was just waiting to get healthy before he fielded, teams, uh, fielded offers from teams. But also, Scott Boris is his agent, so you never know. He might be wanting to get the bag. So what's going on when, with Conforto? You know, if you have anything, I mean, he's not on your team anymore. You don't really have to worry about him. You guys are pretty loaded in, the, loaded in the outfield right now. But why did the Mets decide to give up on Conforto? Because he was a pretty good guy. Did they just feel like there was better options out there? Did they not want to pay him? What happened with Conforto? Yeah, he had a really bad year. And uh, I honestly think that Scott Boris overplayed their hand a little bit. And, and I understand that Michael Conforto um, was looking to get to the big contract. I don't think he should have accepted an extension with the Mets that from, from what the rumor numbers were. Uh, coming off the 2020 season that Conforto had, I agree that he should have wanted to get to free agency. He, he deserved that. And he has been one of the more consistent outfielders in baseball. The problem is there was other players that, I think teams valued more considering his down year and whatever the asking price is. I think it was too much for teams to want him on a long-term deal. And so now he's this year's version of what Dallas Keuchel was for Boris a couple of years ago, where who knows when he signs during the season, it could be in May. It could be in June. We really don't know. Um, I think what's going to happen is at some point, similar to when the Braves lost Acuna last year, there's going to be a significant injury and that's going to open the door for Michael Conforto to get signed somewhere because he can be that impact player. But I just don't know if that's going to be a one-year deal at this point. I don't know what they're looking for because the, the longer this is dragged out, it seems less likely that he's going to get a, a nine-figure contract that I'm sure he he planned on signing going into the offseason. Yeah, he's definitely going to have to take probably a one-year prove deal at some point, maybe as we get, uh, I don't know, Probably another month into the season, there'll probably have to be an injury on some team. I think Mike Trout just got hit by a pitch yesterday, and he might be day to day. So maybe the Angels are a team that could be interested in Michael Conforto. But I got one final question for you, Ryan, before we wrap up today, because the next series for the D-backs is against the Washington Nationals, and by this, by the time this pod or uh, by the time this pod comes out, the D-backs would have already played the first game against the Nationals. But since you're the Mets podcast host and you've already seen the Nationals this year, and now the D-backs are playing the Nationals, and you've already faced the D-backs, who do you think will win that series? You've seen both teams. You've played against both teams. From what you've seen, who do you think will win the D-backs versus Nationals series? It's a weird question to ask, but you're the guy that's seen both the teams. Yeah. Well, I'll say this is the series everyone's watching. It's not going to be yeah. Mets Giants with all those great pitching matchups we're about to see. Uh, it's D backs Nats. I'll tell you that the D backs have played the Mets, I think, pretty much the most competitive so far. I mean, the, the Phillies had one game where they came back late on the Mets bullpen, but the D backs, I mean, really came close to winning that series. So uh, I think the D backs have a good shot here. Where's that series uh, being played? Is it in Arizona or is it in Washington? 
You know, that's a great question, Ryan. And you think as the D-backs host, I would have the answer to that question. So <laughs> I'm just going to look it up. There. No, no, it's okay. That's on me. So I got it pulled up right now. It's in Washington, Ryan. So we're on the East Coast, I guess, for this game tonight. Okay. So I, I was thinking that maybe getting back to Arizona could help that, that lineup uh, get back on track. But yeah, the, the Nationals are not a great team. Uh, the one problem is Juan Soto. So... Yeah, I, I think if you're you're going into this series, Juan Soto is the best player in the series uh, and can certainly win this series himself. Uh, but it, it's one of those series that the D-Bats can definitely win if they're going to be a team that uh, can hover around 500 this year and you know maybe enter a wild card conversation. These are the types of series you have to win on these teams that um, certainly aren't going to throw out the, the best of pitching. I mean, Patrick Corbin was their ace on opening day, so I, I think the D-Bats have a good shot in this one. Um, but the Nats just beat the Braves in a series, if I'm not mistaken. So uh, that's what that's you that's what you know about baseball is any team can win any series, and that that should be a competitive one. Yeah, Pat Corbin is an old friend as well of the D-backs, so we'll that's see right. what happens there. Uh, D-backs rotation ERA is sneakily pretty good. I think it's like top eight in baseball. That's the only reason we're competitive because you saw we we struggle scoring runs, but we can at least keep it close for those first five or six innings with the rotation and maybe the couple early bullpen guys we bring out, but. Ryan, that's the end of this crossover. Let me say thank you for hopping on today. Thank you for giving me the knowledge of what's going on with the Mets organization and previewing a little bit of that D-backs versus Nats series. Uh, hopefully the D-backs do win it because I've been going back with uh, Paul Holden of Lockdown Rockies all season saying the D-backs are going to finish with more wins than the Rockies. And the Rockies are off to a pretty good start in the NOS and the D-backs are already like at the bottom of the division. So I might have been wrong there, but... Uh, before we head out today, where can my listeners find you on social media? And are you also on YouTube? Yes, I'm also on YouTube. So wherever you can find uh, Locked on D-backs, whether it's YouTube or a podcast feed, you can find Locked on Mets. You'll find me on Twitter at Finkelstein Ryan. You can find uh, our show account at Locked on Mets. You can also find some of the work I do over at JustBaseball.com as the managing editor. So. Yeah, go check out Just Baseball. That thing is popping off. That thing is hot right now. That thing is on the come up. So definitely go check out Just Baseball for the Lockdown Mets listeners. Miller Thomas at Creator Thomas 24 for my personal account. Or just look up Lockdown Dimebacks, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube for the podcast handle. Ryan, thank you. And I'll catch you next time, buddy. That's it for this edition of the Lockdown Dimebacks podcast. Go check out Ryan stuff with Locked On Mets. Go make your second listen of the day, Locked On MLB with my pal Sully Baseball. After making your second listen, of, uh, excuse me, after making your first listen of the day, Locked On Diamondbacks. Thank you to everyone who tuned into today's podcast. Come back tomorrow for more Diamondbacks news coverage and insight. And as always, stay safe and stay healthy.